When you visit a haunted location, it's all fun and games until something follows you home. The Southern Ghost Girls, a team of paranormal investigators in Alabama and surrounding states, use period equipment, clothing, and tools to communicate with the ghosts in haunted homes, museums, and jails. However, they've had a few encounters with entities that wanted to keep interacting even after the ladies left and went on their way home. Let's chat with Leslie and Michaela, two Southern Ghost Girl paranormal investigators, today on Homespun Haints. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Haints. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And today on the show, we're so thrilled to bring on the Southern Ghost Girls. These are paranormal investigators. They are historians. They do these events all throughout the South, Alabama, Georgia, and soon Tennessee and Florida. And we have the founding member of the Southern Ghost Girls, Leslie Ann Hyde, and one of her teammates, Michaela Neighbors, today on the show. And they are going to share some stories. And you are going to love these stories. These are not your typical paranormal investigator stories, because these ladies are also psychic. So exactly. you are going to really enjoy what they have to say. And oh my gosh, I am so much more animated. I have to say, Diana, this is the second time we tried to record this. This is. Yeah, it was not going well the other day. Well, we both had <laughs> migraines. We were both like, right. <laughs> <laughs> the show must go on. And you know, sometimes it's just hard to bring the energy. It's hard to fake it when you're only halfway there yourself. Yeah. So for you guys, because we love you, Hainted Loves, you are getting the better re-recorded versions of Becky and Diana. A better Becky. A better Diana. A better Becky sounds better. It's a, it's a better tongue twister. A better Becky and a decent Diana. A decent Diana. Is that, that, yes. that acceptable? Are you decent? Are you wearing a shirt this time? Um, no. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, remember that time we were recording and I was wearing a white camisole, I guess, because I was hot. But I am so pale. <laughs> <laughs> Diana's like, are you naked? <laughs> I couldn't see the straps against your white, white, white shoulders. Yeah, she thought I was like in the nude. This is why we're made for audio. Because <laughs> you can never tell if we're wearing clothes or not. I'm not even wearing pants. And neither are you, just, Diana. Yeah, no, nope, just this dress. It's got pockets. I don't need pants. <laughs> so, Diana, I understand you had a little incident this morning you want to talk about? I had an experience that I experienced through a friend. And you'll have to tell me if this has any paranormal significance or if you know more about photography than I do. Mm. Maybe maybe you'll know the mechanism behind this strange thing that I saw this morning. So okay. I have a buddy who is always encouraging me to eat local produce and go get local eggs and get local milk. And she does all this stuff. She always calls me when she's at a market that's far away from my house because she's so generous. And she asked me the other day, do you need anything from Pan Asia Mart, which is a fantastic Asian market in my city, but far from my house. And I said, actually, I don't need anything, but my dog does need a beef heart for her food because my Mm -hmm. dog has heart problems so we Mm -hmm. feed her heart so she picked me up a heart she was like i'm gonna be in your area for a farmer's market i'll just swing by and i said oh the farmer's market i haven't been to a farmer's market since before the pandemic what's it like nowadays take photos for me and so she showed up and took a photo just the one of the whole market i'll send you the photo now becky so you can take a look at it tell me what you think about this photo it's just a normal sunny day in oklahoma Oklahomans walking around an Oklahoma farmer's market, Oklahoma farmers vending their Oklahoma farmed goods, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you some time. Um, is her phone not doing a very good job with color? Well, it's a sunny day, so it should have full color. But yeah, zoom in on that little child in the center in the three-wheeled perambulator. What do they call them in English? Carriage? <laughs> Stroller. <laughs> Stroller, yeah. (laughs) Carriage. He's just 100% in black and white. Wait, are you looking at the same child as me? No. (laughs) Look at the other three-wheeled perambulator towards the right center of the photograph in the background. That is weird. You see what I see? Uh Uh-huh. 
He's a black and white child. It's a black and white child. Completely like... Grayscale. Grayscale. There's no color in that child at all. And his father standing right behind him is in full color. Even like if you zoom in on the awning above him, that's in full color. Even though it's white, it's still full color. Even yeah. the brown tree, you can see the color. But the child, there's no color in that child. All right. I am going to have to debunk this. What's happening is because the pixels are so big in comparison to the image mm. that I don't think they have enough. Um, they're small enough to convey the information that they need to with the color. But mm. that is weird with the boy. You would think there would be something. Well, Diana, I don't want to let you down. I think it's a ghost. I think it's a ghost. Hey, it's not my photo. So I asked my friend, I zoomed in on the boy and I took a screenshot and I said, all I really want to know about the farmer's market is why is this boy black and white? And about 20 minutes later, she texted me, sorry, I lost him. (gasps) She went looking at him. So I guess she followed them for 20 minutes trying to get another photo. That was so, so sweet of her. Maybe she lost him because they were never really there. See, Uh it's not that crowded of a market. That's true. Okay. I'll post this photo if my friend gives me the full-size image and permission to post it. I will post this photo and you guys can look at our show notes at homespunhaints.com slash whatever this episode is titled, etc. <laughs> Just do a search for it in the search bar. You'll yeah, find it. Yeah. Southern Ghost Girls. And it, yeah, you, you let me know. I mean, technological glitch? Strange grayscale child? Superimposed ghost? child i don't know what this was yeah that's that would be my other theory is that the child is fine (laughs) the child's fine it's just we're looking at him through a ghost that's either that or the child's possessed Ooh, that could be the case too i don't don't know know. it just jumped out of the photo at me so intensely and and you do have to turn the brightness all the way up to really see the contrast but i imagine becky with your photo editing skills if you were to like raise the contrast and brightness and hue and tint and stuff all the way you might you don't be want me to, bright- uh, adjusting the hue and tint because then it will change it from black then and it white. will change it from black and white oh yeah that's right yeah that's why you have photo editing skills and i don't i will blow it up i will see what we can do <laughs> i'll try and get the full size file from her let's see if we can get the original because maybe we'll see the original and i'll be like oh kid's fine it looks like he's like a three-year-old boy i would hate for anything to be wrong with him like him being possessed or dead well It happens. It happens every day. I know, but let's not dwell on it. (laughs) The whole point of this podcast is kind of dwelling on possessed children, but okay, whatever you say. (laughs) We do have a new patron to give a shout out to. Oh boy. We want to give a shout out to Connie. Thank you so much for joining our Patreon. Thank you, Connie. Welcome. Our Patreon is the place where you can get all of these episodes without commercials and bonus content. And we have been getting even weirder with our bonus content. It is stuff we cannot air here on the air. Nasty. Creepy stuff. Creepy. Sexy stuff. Perhaps. Will you be the judge? Join our Patreon and let us know. So you guys have heard on this show about Diana's haunted basement and her haunted crawl space that she will not open unless I'm there. However, Diana may not have the house for very much longer. So if you want to know what's in that crawl space... Well, it's more of a secret passageway. Secret passageway. A human could not crawl into that space. But a ghost could. Maybe a rat. (laughs) So here's the deal. If we can get... 100 patrons by September 1st. I will go to Tulsa. I will go to Tulsa and we will live stream us opening this secret passageway for our patrons. For the first time in half a century. Yeah, but we can't afford to do it. <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless you bankroll it. So. Unless we get the patrons. <laughs> yeah, and this will be this will be a special Patreon only event. Yes. Yeah, so. so if you want to know what's in Diana's haunted basement, and I don't know, mm. I'm just gonna put a disclaimer. It could just be like opening off a safe. We might just <laughs> open it up and there's like a toothbrush in there. I don't know. But never you know, that would be creepy, though, actually. Anything would be creepy. Yeah. So if you want to see it, join Connie and all of the other new patrons. And and you might here. be protecting a national treasure because otherwise I move out of this house and that space stays sealed for perhaps forever. Exactly. What's inside shall never be discovered. So sign up for that Patreon subscription. You get more than just bonus content. You also get all content ad-free. 
And if you're not a member of our Patreon, enjoy this commercial. Today on the show, we have two wonderful women from the Southern Ghost Girls. We have the owner, Leslie Ann Hyde, and one of her paranormal investigators, Michaela Neighbors, on the show today. We are so thrilled to have them on. I discovered these ladies when I was actually looking for some spooky things to do around Georgia. So they do actually have events in Georgia. They have things in Alabama. They're going to be moving into Tennessee and maybe Florida soon. So welcome. Welcome so much, ladies. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be on the show. So, Leslie, tell us a little bit about how everything got started with your company. Well, I started having experiences when I was about six years old, paranormal experiences and phenomena. Throughout my entire life, I've always had experiences such as hearing things, seeing things, voices talking to me. I can hear voices did not really understand all of that. And then around in my 20s, when I would travel, I started doing all the different ghost walks and ghost tours and investigations. But that was a while back. And there was not a lot of those. They were just mainly in the main cities like Savannah, Georgia, or New Orleans, or Charleston, those kind of things. But I I would investigate and do my own paranormal. And just, it's been a hobby throughout my life. And I've continued to have these experiences with a lot of psychic phenomena. I've actually helped with some police departments and solving some crimes. Two departments that I've helped with, there was one, a major case here in Alabama that I got a psychic message spoken to me. I was having dreams about it. I could see the entire crime taking place and where she was buried. I could see the people involved. I actually called the police department and they took my information. Another detective called me back. And I thought, well, they're going to think I'm crazy because, you know, Mm -hmm. and I told them, I said, I'm having these visions. I gave them the exact information and there was literally an arrest. It came over the news about three hours later of the person that I had seen and described and the name of the person. Oh, wow. It was incredible. So I feel like God has blessed me with gifts. I've been doing insurance for a very long time. And around 2018, I guess I always tell people I was going through a midlife crisis. And I said, I want to do good for the community. I want to do good for people. I want to help humankind. And I want to use my gifts. And that's when I started our Southern Ghost Girls Paranormal Team. And I wanted it to be very specific with it all being women, professional women. I'm very particular with who is on the team We have about 10 girls now that are active members. Not everybody does every investigation or tour, but we are all ladies with psychic abilities. Pretty much everyone on the team does have abilities and a special gift, and we use it for the good. And then we do the tours. We do tours that are open to the public. So that's how, in a nutshell, it came about. And it's just been, we've been very blessed and very successful and helped a lot of people. What is your website so people who are in the area can look for one of these tours to go on investigations? Okay. All they would need to do is go to southernghostgirls.com. You can book a tour or an event. The website has information about us and about the team. It has also the ticket link to purchase tickets, and it shows all of our upcoming events. And we sell our tickets through Eventbrite. You can also go into our Facebook page, and that's Southern Ghost Girls Tours. And then all of our tickets and things are on sale there. And when people book the tour, their money is not just going to us. Our big cause is we donate back to the historic venues and to charity. A large portion of the proceeds does go for historic preservation when you do book a tour through us. That's awesome. That is really cool. Speaking of venues, Michaela, you specialize in the Jasper Jail in Jasper, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the Jasper Jail and some of the history and some of the things that people see or experience there. So it was built in the 1900s. 
was the only jail in the county and it was in operation until 1980. Let's just say that. But when you go in, you're like, no, there's no way this was in operation until the 80s because it looks like something out of medieval times. <laughs> oh my god! So there's no AC, <laughs> no heat. It's really rough conditions. You have like a female side and a men's side and the one bathroom. I mean, it is rough. It's archaic. Of barbaric conditions. I just can't believe it. And the jail was built starting in 1900. So you had people there in 1980 still being in jail and the state actually shut them down. I mean, they came in like, this is bad. It's mm. really rough. And so there's different things up there. There is this spirit that they call Shadow Man. And he likes to stay up in the men's side and he is seen by a lot of people. He's actually scared one of our teammates so bad that she has not come back when she saw him. Mm -mm. He's a really tall guy. I've seen him just in a glance one time when I was setting up and I said, oh, I just saw Shadow run past those cells. And they're like, that's probably Shadow Man. He is up there for sure. He definitely haunts. But then you've also got the spirits of different inmates that have come through. You've got downstairs in the actual living quarters of the jail because the sheriff and his family live there. Their families will sometimes come across. We have children that come across. It's also right there on the old Federal Road and the Trail of Tears. So we do even have spirits of Cherokee who come across and they tell their story. And then in the cabin next door, it's the Kirby Quentin cabin. It was built by a Native American family. And it is haunted by a family with some young children in there. When we go in there, it's a little more lively and loving compared to the jail. When you go from the jail, it's a little dark. And you got started with this when you went on a public tour and ended up having something following you home. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to Jasper, Georgia jail for a tour, I was just a paying customer, had a great time, got home. That next night I'm in bed and my husband was downstairs still. It was like 11 o'clock at night. So I'm asleep and I feel something on the end of the bed and it's this dark figure. I look up and it's got like a real broad stance just leaning over me. And of course I woke up real quick and I started swatting like, get down, get down, thinking it was my husband. And he heard me and he came up and nothing was there. I mean, but I knew something was there, you know, I saw it. Uh And so then when I went to the jail again, I was speaking with one of the team members and we have this device called a spirit box, which makes this creepy turn up tune when there's motion. And so when I would ask, I'd said, I think something followed me home from the jail. It played. And I was like, Ooh, (laughs) <laughs> and then it would play every time I would give a detail and it hadn't played all night. So <laughs> that place is pretty creepy, but that's when I got yeah. really involved and yeah. I just love being on the team and we really tie in the history, try to match up the history to what we experience and try to learn more. Ooh, <laughs> I first started seeing things as a child. So I've grown up in North Georgia and my parents built our house that we lived in. We built it in 2003 and it was on land in Talking Rock. Georgia, which is Native American land. It's rumored that before it used to be apple orchards and those had all caught on fire. And we would go around on the land and we'd find old chimneys and pottery and things. And it was neat. But you know, when you build a house, you don't think it's haunted. So as a child, one day I was in third grade and my mom was in her bedroom and I had to go across the house to get something out of the pantry. So I'm coming back. I think it was a food drive at this school and I needed to verify I could take this can of green beans. (laughs) So I'm coming across with it and (laughs) next to our piano, there's just this white floating figure. And I just remember stopping in my my steps and I'm just like, what is this? I didn't scream. And once I got caught up, I went running into my mom's room and she remembers to this day, she's like, you're so scared. And I know you told me about it. I couldn't make out what it was. It was definitely a woman but no features. It's just kind of like the long hair and it was a long flowy dress, but they weren't touching the floor. They were floating. So that was my first thing. And then on that same land, there's been other things that have happened. We would go walk the trails around the house. And one day I was with my boyfriend and I heard Michaela and I thought, Oh, it's mom or dad calling me. And he heard it too. And we're walking back and I asked, I said, what do y'all need? You called me. And they're like, no, I asked my brother. No, no one said my name. So that's a little bit spooky. What did it feel like to see something there for the first time? What'd that feel like? I mean, you know, as a kid, it's like, you know, that's not normal. And I I am a little bit of a chicken. (laughs) But just having that happen, it really got me interested in the paranormal. What did your mother say? I mean, how old were you when you had the green beans and you saw the, the white lady? So my mom, she doesn't believe in it a lot, but she's like, something really did happen to you. I've never seen you just so. It was 
did they say like you're white like you've seen a ghost <laughs> it was kind of like uh-huh. that like just the life was like sucked mm-hmm. out of me it was just very scary i slept with my door shut after that because my room was really close to where i saw it in addition to that first thing that you saw when you were a child in your house and then the figure that you saw sitting on your bed the first time you came back from the jail what other things have you seen what would you say was the scariest besides the things you've already told us so definitely the jail was probably my scariest thing like when i came home and had that on the bed that was so terrifying i've had a few things happen since that where i've been in bed and felt the covers be tugged and then in different locations we've seen things just i think was it two months ago leslie we were at scottsboro the Brown Proctor house and we're sitting in a tour group and Leslie's in there with me and we've got people asking questions and I'm looking down this hallway and it's a motion sensor light hallway. So someone had walked through recently. So the light was on, but I see this arm manifest out of the wall, just this black and it's like a crooked arm. I didn't want to scream or anything. Cause I'm like, maybe I'm not seeing that, but I just said, guys, I think I've just seen this arm come out of the wall. And then Leslie says, I just saw the same thing. And so when someone says that, it's like, oh my gosh. I saw it and said it like the same time you did. It wasn't like she had said it and then I was like, oh yeah, I see it too. No, no, I saw it in real time when she saw it. And it was like this crooked black shadow shadow arm arm that (laughs) just came out of the wall and then went back in. Mm -hmm. And there's no door there. It's just a hallway that's been added onto this old house as an addition. That could have been a pathway someone walked before right. just on land, but it was before just... Before the addition was there. Mm-hmm. So when she also said it, it was like, in your mind, you're trying to quickly say, maybe I didn't see that. Maybe I, that's not that. But then when someone also sees it, it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Do you feel like you got any other communication from that particular entity? We had a few coming through. There's a lot of gentlemen that own the house and different owners that we were talking to. So it easily could have been one of those, but I'm just not sure. There's a lot of memorabilia also in the house or in the museum from different people from all walks of life. So I do believe it could have been something that was attached to some of the antiques or memorabilia. They have like famous people from the area. Like there's a a person named Curly Putnam that was a songwriter for George Jones and Cammy (laughs) White. And they have his Grammy there. We do an experiment called the Tipping Table. And we also do the human pendulum. And in both experiments, we had evidence come through that Curly Putnam was there. The tipping table was turning on its own when we asked if his spirit was here. Is this a Grammy over here or any of your awards here? So I think the Brown Proctor Museum and Home, I do believe that Curly Putnam is there. (laughs) <laughs> We've never had anybody talk about a tipping table before. Can you do do a little history about what that is and how you think it works? Yes. So with our team, we use like the state of the art things that you see on all the ghost shows and everything. <laughs> we use all that in our tours and our private investigations. But we as the Southern Ghost Girls, we really emphasize on historical value. What kind of differentiates us? And I'm very particular about it and everyone is on our team. We really will investigate the history or research. We also dress in time period clothing. So if it's a place that was from the 1800s that we're investigating at, we wear Victorian gowns. If it was 1920s, we're going to dress in 1920s attire, 1914 attire. So we we really strive to be very authentic, I guess you could say. The tipping table. So going back to that, that's a very important thing because the tipping table is an actual Victorian device or way of communication with the spirits. Queen Victoria made it popular. It was very popular around the Civil War. People used it to communicate with their deceased loved ones. Our tipping table is a antique table from the 1800s with a marble top. The marble top can spin around. It's like a lazy Susan. And we all place our fingers on the table and we ask questions and we ask spirit to communicate, come through and communicate with us by using and showing us signs with the table. So we will say, can you please turn the table to the left if there's a spirit here that would like to communicate with us? The table can actually turn or tilt with communication with spirit. 
the way you described it sounds just like a pendulum. It is, yeah. But with multiple people influencing mm-hmm. it, kind of like a Ouija board. Yes, there are, usually we'll have three or four people sitting around the table. And I'll tell you, the first time that we communicated with a spirit using that, we were up in Tennessee. I was screaming. My <laughs> mind was blown. I had never in my life experienced something just it was incredible it was incredible so when we have our tours and we allow people to use the tipping table that's their most favorite piece of equipment they don't even like the brand new stuff with all the shining bright lights and everything the tipping table blows their minds and when they're sitting there and we have spirit communicating with us and the table is turning on command and we know no (laughs) one is turning it it is just an awesome experience And is the human pendulum kind of the same idea where you close your eyes and you see which direction your body wants to sway? Well, we usually I'll open it up. I know some of the other team members also open it up. On our tours, I try to open it up. We'll have a volunteer in the middle and spirit will channel through that person. I will open that person up to receive spirit. The person will stand in the middle. We form kind of a circle around the person standing in the middle there. So that person is allowing the spirit to channel through and we ask the spirit to communicate with us, of course, uh, a spirit of love and light and non-malevolent spirit to come through at a time. And we ask if there is a spirit here, can you please show us by using the person's body by pushing them forward, backwards, side to side or circles. And the spirit will come through that person and that person's body will actually swing forward or backwards in a certain direction. And that person normally kind of goes into a trance-like state. They don't even know that their body is doing this, but the spirit is communicating with us. So yes, you're just like a pendulum. (laughs) The person is just like a pendulum. And then I use a special practice where I bring in Archangel Michael and I close the person down for the spirit to detach. I know Michaela does this experiment too. Not every girl on the team does it. They're not quite comfortable enough to do it, but it's one of my most favorite things too. People just, people love it. They're amazed. Leslie, I know that you talked about how you've always kind of seen and heard things and you've had these psychic visions, which allow you to actually help out in police investigations. What would you say was one of the scariest experiences that you had when you were first kind of learning about these gifts that you have? I don't really talk about this a lot, but this did happen. I'll talk about it. And this happened actually the first night we had investigated at the Jasper, Georgia jail, where Michaela is from. I would say I was naive to it, I feel. I'd always had things happen to me, but, you know, I didn't really, I've done a lot of study and practice now to know how to block myself or not enter into an emotion. I observe. I have certain things I put up now, shields, I guess you could say. But back then, I think it was probably 2019, I was very open and like, okay, well, let's just do this and stuff. And we had an experience. We did the human pendulum. We did the human pendulum. I had only seen it one time done and I did it with the people on the historical society there. It was after our tour. We had stayed late. And I was the pendulum. And I guess I should have never let the other person do it because you really have to know what you're doing. So we did have a spirit come through me. I feel like it was a very dark, dark entity. I wouldn't even say it was a person that was in jail there. I I feel like it was more of some sort of like elemental or something that had came through and they closed me down, but I don't feel like I was completely closed. And the person I was with, we drove home that night. We actually drove back to Alabama. It was Halloween night. It was Halloween night. We drove back to Alabama and the whole night, the other person kept saying, this is the strangest experience. I feel like I'm in like a time warp, like something is not right. And I felt it too. And we got to Alabama. It became November 1st. It was like 1201. And again, I don't talk about this a lot because some people might think I'm crazy, but we had, I feel it was a shapeshifter. We both, me and the other person who was a skeptic, by the way, saw it come from the sky, hover over our windshield. It looked like a prehistoric 
pterodactyl or some sort of demon. Mm. It was it was horrible. It hovered over the car. He continued to drive the car. We both were just stunned. We didn't even know what to say. And then from my right side, a ray of light came forward. I know, I know y'all are thinking, you can't even make this stuff up. <laughs> a ray of white light came. The whitest, brightest light I and he had ever seen in our lives. And it hit that pterodactyl looking demon thing and it just disintegrated and when that happened I had like you know southern ghost girl magnets I had things on my truck everything blew off the truck and the windshield wipers flexed up I mean it was crazy and this bright light was in a flash inside the cab we looked at each other and we were like what in the world what in the world And he was like, what did you think that was? And well, the first thing I thought was from my right side, my guardian angel came and just kicked that thing's butt. (laughs) I mean, and I believe that. I believe we were in severe danger, but I do believe from my right side, yes, my guardian angel kicked into action. I mean, there's no other explanation for this. This was, this was like something out of Star Wars. (laughs) I actually really grew from it. It opened my eyes and it, it taught me I've got to be more careful with these things. I always tell people, you may have psychic abilities, but you've got to learn and knowing how to use them in the correct way. That was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. It taught me you got to be a lot more careful. That would be scary. I'd be willing to do that if you were there, though. (laughs) I'll be a human pendulum for you, but not for some inexperienced historian. No, 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 you don't want to do that. Leslie, you talked about how you've always had these abilities. What would you say was the first thing that happened to you that made you realize like, hey, I am definitely seeing things that other people aren't seeing. I'm hearing things people aren't hearing. So many things have happened over my life. But I guess one thing that sticks out is I was looking for something that needed to be found in order to solve an issue or a problem that me and another person were experiencing. And I had a dream. And in the dream, the voice came to me (laughs) and told me verbatim where to go to find these documents to solve these issues. The documents are at this certain location. You are going to look under the left seat cushion. You are going to then lift. I mean, I was told in verbatim, And it is of an evil nature. It was the last word that this entity that spoke to me. And I immediately woke up. And it was like 5 o'clock in the morning. And I immediately got in my car and went to the location that it told me to. And I got into the place and lifted the left seat cushion (laughs) and went into it. And there was all the evidence that we needed. There. And I'm just standing there in total shock, like, oh my gosh, this is real. So all of that re- just really cemented in me. Oh my goodness, I'm blessed. I need to help people, basically. It was confirmation. How about you, Michaela? Do you ever receive visions? You nodding? <laughs> yes. Well, before Ghost Girls, I've always had kind of like coincidental things. So for one example, this was the weirdest one that really sticks out to me. I was driving home from school and I just got this, I don't want to say a vision, but like this feeling of, oh my gosh, there's me something in the road and it's, it's dead. There's something in the road. And I'm like, what? And so I went a different way home, which is weird. Why would I do that? And I come across in front of my boyfriend's house at the time and there's this big old thing in the road. And I'm like, it looks like a couch cushion. It was their golden retriever. She had just been <gasps> hit by a car, but she was still alive. She was just in bad condition Mm. and so I like whipped in there and helped but just that feeling how it was sent to me I was like why would that pop in my head there's gonna be something in the road it's gonna be a big thing in the road it was just weird that sticks out to me but since joining the ghost girls and being more involved in paranormal investigations I get feelings so when we did human pendulum I've been choked I get this feeling it's almost like when you start having strep throat and you're like oh, my throat feels really tight and uncomfortable. And so that happens during human pendulum. And we've confirmed with a spirit that apparently I remind her of the Cherokee woman her husband cheated with. And so I get choked. Um. I've had that. And one time I've had at the tipping table, we can communicate to family members, past loved ones for people. 
And so we had a guy there and his mom came through. And all of a sudden, it just felt like I'd been hit in the chest. Like my chest was just so tight, it was hurting. And I said, did she pass of something with the heart? And he said, yeah, congestive heart failure. And I was like, oh, just feeling that it was like a confirmation. So I have stuff like that where it's almost like emotions and pains. I've had a stabbing pain where we were talking to a spirit who was stabbed to death. I think that's what my sensitivities are. Maybe I do get some visions, but I think mine's more like feelings and emotion. Have you ever felt like you were in peril, like physical peril because of this ability? You know, I do wonder sometimes, like, what's the long-term effects? If you take on all of these pains, I mean, that does cross my mind. Obviously, as soon as we close pendulum, like the choking pain or the chest pain, it goes away. It's like an instant release. So other than like feeling drained, but it does make you wonder what could be the long term of being exposed. And then you dress in period costume. What's the reasoning behind dressing in period costume? Well, in paranormal, a lot of times when you're investigating, you want to set out trigger objects. And wearing the actual clothing from the historical period of the spirits that we are trying to communicate with, then that puts that spirit more at ease to communicate with us. And I feel that it works. And we have a lot of spirits open up to us. I mean, if you wouldn't believe, I've heard teams are like, we didn't get any evidence. Nothing happened. But with us, I'm telling you, the evidence is out of the world. We get children talking to us. I feel like the children feel safe with us because we are a women group and we wear the kind of clothes like their parents would have on, correct? And we're not threatening. Whereas if just a team goes in wearing a black t-shirt and jeans, does that really resonate with the spirits you're trying to reach out to in the 1800s or 1700s? We want to be inviting to be able to speak to to the spirit. I feel like that's such a beautiful method of surrender. The idea of you don't have to accommodate me, I'll accommodate you. I feel like that's a very feminine aspect of ghost hunting. The idea of being like, well, maybe I could make you more comfortable with the way that I'm dressed, dressing in your clothing instead of my time period. We do it for the communication with the, the spirits and ghosts. And I just think we get so much more evidence than... Yes, we are accommodating them. We're telling them it's a safe space. We do have one man that does help us on the team. And he actually dresses up full-fledged, I mean, in the historical clothing, too. So he loves to dress up. It's just a great method because we respect that spirit. And we want them to recognize us that we're there to help instead of hinder. That's very cool. When you had the visions about the case that you worked with the police on, that then they arrested that same person you saw hours later, how did you put it together, what the relevance of those visions were? How did you know it was applicable to an ongoing case and not something that happened 100 years ago? Well, it was just weird, too. That was just weird. And I remember this specifically happening. So I'm very much an empath. I don't like to look at the news and bad things that are happening. I know they're out there happening, but I don't want to enter into that horrible negative trauma, right? But there was a kidnapping here in Alabama. It was a very big case, probably about three, four years ago now. And she was abducted in Auburn, Alabama. I mean, the news media was all over it, even the national news, because her father was like a WWE wrestler. And he was famous, but she had been abducted and kidnapped. Well, I, like I said, I don't hardly ever watch the news, but every time I turn the news on, there this beautiful young lady is. And I tried not to look at her, but I just kept getting drawn in to this one particular person. And every time I turned the news on or the TV or my phone, she was there. It just started bothering me. It just started bothering me. I was like, and I got really emotionally involved in, in this case and everything and following it. I then had the same dream and vision. It was about five nights in a row. That again, the angel that I spoke about that comes and speaks to me and tells me exactly verbatim where things are, how to solve the problem, what to do about it. I had the same exact dream and she spoke to me five nights in a row. I was like telling my family and friends, I was like, what do I do? I keep having these. I was crying about it. I was really messed up, distraught. 
And I was like, I'm going to get the nerve up to call the police because I'd never done this before. And, you know, psychics or mediums don't have a very good reputation a lot of times. With I would think they wouldn't want to listen at all when you call them up and say, hey, I know this is weird, but I've been having dreams. I, I can't imagine a police officer listening to me saying that. Well, they were desperate to find this girl. So I got my nerve up. I was sitting in the parking lot talking to my mother. I was like, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. So when I got home, I called the police department. They were like, oh, yeah, because when I started telling them what I was seeing, their ears opened. I could tell, okay, wait, she's on to something here. And he goes, okay, keep telling us. I said, okay, I mean, you don't think I'm crazy? And he's like, no, honey, you're not crazy. I mean, that you could tell there was excitement in their voice that I was telling them this, that I saw exactly what happened, what happened, what happened, where she was, who helped transport her body, everything. And I even told them the day she would be found, you will find her body the week of Thanksgiving. I even told them that because that's what my angel told me. He goes, okay, honey, I'm going to, I'm going to let go detective so-and-so or sergeant so-and-so is going to call you back. So I got another call back. I told them the same thing. And literally my son had a basketball game that night. I was listening to the radio. We had driven to the basketball game and it came over breaking news. So-and-so, so-and-so has been arrested. And the craziest thing, what my angel was telling me, there was an accomplice named Slimy. I said, and I described what the person looked like. And I said, in his name, but I'm getting, he's got a nickname. He goes by Slimy. And when I told them that, you could hear them. They were like, oh my gosh, thank you. You could tell I was on to something. I didn't even know mm. this person, right? But they said on the news that night, they said, and his nickname was Squirmy. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. I was close. <laughs> they said his name was Squirmy, and they had his mugshot up there on the news, and it was him. But Slimy <laughs> Squirmy, I, so I mean, you know, oh my crazy? gosh, yes, her body was found the week of Thanksgiving. It was found that Tuesday, and Thanksgiving was that Thursday of that week of the week that they found her. Do you think that's an Alabama thing that they listened to you? And maybe if you lived in Chicago, you wouldn't have gotten the same reception from the police. I couldn't believe they were so nice and welcoming and accommodating. They were like, no, tell us more, honey. Literally, they were like, tell us more. No, we're listening. I just thank God, you know, I just thank God. I mean, he sent me his angel or the entity to tell me this and that whole thing, good versus evil. I think I'm used as a light to shine the goodness and to try to prevail over evil and I thank God every day. You know, people people judge me. That's very hurtful. I mean, people that don't understand, they call me names and this or that. And she's crazy, just like in the community and stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm doing this for the good of God. <laughs> and they're like, no, that's it can't be true. That's demonic forces. It is not. God would not give me this gift if he does not want me to use it for the good. Absolutely. Truly. Michaela has the gifts and, and other girls on my team definitely do. And we got to keep shining that bright light. Absolutely. These have been very fascinating stories. It's been great to get a chance to chat with you. Tell us one more time where people can find out more about you. Find us at southernghostgirls.com. We really would love for you to come to one of our public tours and investigations. I'm scheduling all the time. I don't schedule too far out, but I schedule. And I feel like if you've ever wanted to try something like this, or even if you are an experienced investigator, come investigate with us. It's a very open environment, welcoming, a safe space for you to do this. A majority of proceeds go to charity or the venues. And we can help you if you have questions, if you're seeing things or experiencing things and people don't have anyone to talk to about this a lot of times and they want answers and they want to be around people that they can say oh wow you've experienced this too <laughs> so so come to one of our tours investigations and find us at southernghostgirls.com or our facebook page southern ghost girls tours Thank you for having us on, and we'd love for you to join us on one of the tours. As Leslie said, it's just a lot of fun, and you may learn stuff that you didn't know was out there, or you may contact a family member that you would have never expected to. It's, it's just really neat, so we appreciate you having us on. Very cool. Well, I know I'm looking forward to checking out Jasper Jail, 
You're not too far from me, so you'll probably see me before too long. Painted Loves, y'all have been listening to Michaela Neighbors and Leslie Ann Hyde of Southern Ghost Girls. We are so thrilled that you had a chance to share your stories with us. Those were excellent, spooky stories. I can tell you two do shine a bright light, and we really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Painted Loves, what do you think? Are you going to go up to the Jasper Jail in Georgia? If you do, you're guaranteed to have a spooky day. Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media, LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit.